Hello, this is Philosophy 183, Firearms, Technology, History, and Politics, and I'm your instructor, Professor Van Norden. Uh, in my lecture today, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to the course overall and an overview of some of the themes in the course. Some of the things I'm going to be going over, I'm going to go over very quickly, so don't worry, everything I cover will cover in a lot more detail later in the course. Today, I just want to give you a flavor for what the course is about. Now, you might be wondering why I decided to teach this course in the first place. Well, firearms are an extremely important aspect of world history. You can't understand world history without understanding the role that firearms have played in world history. Firearms are deeply influential in the contemporary U.S., but they're also extremely controversial. In my opinion, Americans are divided between those who are extremely knowledgeable about firearms on the one hand, and those who, although they may have strong opinions about firearms, are largely ignorant about firearms. And usually in the U.S., people on the political right favor less regulation of firearms, while people on the political left favor more regulation of firearms. But there is a left-wing case to be made for less regulation of firearms, and it's worth knowing what it is, whatever your own opinion is. And, this might surprise some of you, although I am a politically progressive college professor, I do own some firearms. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in this lecture. Now, just a reminder, by New York State law and by our college regulations, firearms are not permitted on campus. I don't live on campus. Many professors do, but I do not. Um, but I will never bring any firearms to campus or to our class. And you and I and all of us on campus are forbidden from having any firearms on campus. So don't worry about anybody bringing a firearm into this class. I'm not going to do it, and none of you should do it either. So as the subtitle of the course is, you know, it's Firearms, Technology, History, and Politics, and that kind of summarizes the three major themes of the course. And that's the order that we're going to cover those topics in the course. So first, technology. And by that I mean what are firearms, what types of firearms are there, uh, how do they work, how are they used, what are their abilities, what are their limitations. Then we'll move on to the history of firearms. How was gunpowder? discovered and how was it first used? How did firearm technology develop over time from the earliest firearms to today? What different historical consequences did firearms have in different regions in different periods in history? Because gunpowder and firearms were developed in China, but they were first perfected in Europe. And I have what I think is a really interesting lecture talking about why I think that that is. And we'll also, in the history section, look a little bit at how firearms have been portrayed in popular media. And I know many students are interested either in screenwriting or working in the some uh, entertainment industry or something like that. And so, again, just understanding firearms is useful for that kind of career, too. Finally, we'll look at the politics of firearms in the United States. How have legislation, regulation, and Supreme Court decisions regarding firearms changed over time in the US, what are some of the arguments for and against gun control, and what data do we have about the effects of firearm regulations. And if you saw the course title Firearms and you said, oh wow, this is going to be great, I want to spend a whole semester arguing about gun control, you're going to be disappointed in this course. Like I say, we're going to start off with technology, go on to history, and in the last third of the course, will deal broadly with legislative and political issues, and a lot of that will be looking at things like the history of the Second Amendment, different ways in which the Supreme Court has interpreted the Second Amendment, and things like that. So if you're really looking forward to a semester arguing about gun control, I'm sorry, that's not this course. Um, but although the first part of the course is going to be about technology and then about history, the reason I'm starting with technology and history has to do with getting a better understanding of the politics behind gun control debates. So in this lecture, I'm going to start off with a little bit about the politics of gun control, just to whet your appetite, and to help you see why you need to understand the technology and the history 
in order to have an informed opinion about the politics. So a few years ago, uh, this meme was bouncing around the internet. I think this example comes from Instagram, but I think it was found on other social media as well. It's from a, uh, an, a group, Act for America. You might want to look up after class the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center's assessment of Act for America. Uh, but as you can see, this meme attributes this quotation to conservative hero U.S. President Ronald Reagan. Under no pretext should arms and ammunition be surrendered. Any attempt to disarm the people must be stopped by force if necessary. And the problem is Reagan didn't say that. Um, someone did say something a lot like this, but it wasn't Reagan. It was Karl Marx in his address to the Communist League of 1850. And here's the complete context for what Marx said at that time. He said, the arming of the whole proletariat with rifles, guns, and ammunition must be carried out at once. The workers must try to organize themselves into an independent guard with their own chiefs and general staff to put themselves under the order, not of the government, but of the revolutionary authorities set up by the workers. Under no pretext must they give up their arms and equipment, and any attempt at disarmament must be forcibly resisted, which is very close to the quotation attributed to Reagan. So not only did Reagan not say that thing that's actually pretty close to something Karl Marx said, but in fact, when before he was president, when he was governor of California, Reagan said, there is absolutely no reason why out on the street today a civilian should be carrying a loaded weapon. And in fact, while he was governor, Reagan signed the Mulford Act, which banned carrying loaded weapons in public. Well, again, Reagan's a big hero of the American conservative movement, and it's kind of surprising to see him saying these things which seem to you know, be against you know, public carry of firearms and actually outlawing carrying loaded weapons in public, which were things that the people on the right now generally are in favor of, why did Reagan care about this issue so much? Well, during this period, the police in California were harassing and sometimes gratuitously assaulting African Americans. And so some African Americans formed the Black Panther Party. And part of what the Black Panther Party did was to set up armed patrols in which people carrying shotguns and other weapons would patrol African-American neighborhoods in order to deter the police from harassing or assaulting African-Americans. And it seems like it worked, at least in some cases. So when the Mulford Act, which would ban publicly carrying loaded weapons, was being debated, the Black Panther Party went to the Capitol and walked into the Capitol building to protest the Mulford Act. And, but as a result, the Mulford Act was passed almost immediately. Um, and the complexity of these issues surrounding firearms are very characteristic of the United States, which has a very complicated gun culture. So let's look a little bit at American gun culture. I've got an Instagram account. And one of the uh, things that comes up on my Instagram feed about once a month, I think, uh, there's an account that just posts a picture of uh, the Bible open to a particular passage, a cup of black coffee, and a 45 uh, semi-automatic pistol uh, in you know different configurations and Bible open to different passages, but always those three items. Another thing that I sometimes get on my Instagram feed is pictures of scantily clad women holding uh, firearms. I hasten to add this is Instagram guessing what I want to see uh, and not me requesting it. Uh, but this is an example of one of the more tame images uh, that you can get. A woman wearing lingerie with a come hither look on her face and holding a glass of wine in one hand and a 45, uh, actually might not be a 45, but a semi-automatic pistol in the other and a bunch of other weapons surrounding her and an American flag in the background. And this combination of combining firearms with religion or firearms with patriotism or firearms with sexuality is actually surprisingly common in a lot of representations of firearms in the U.S., 
Another example of the complexity of gun culture in the U.S., uh, this is the name of a gun range and gun store in New Jersey. And if you live in New York, you can go there, you can rent guns if you'd like to shoot them. I'm not telling you to shoot guns, I'm not telling you not to shoot guns, but I'm just saying that this is a very nice range. If you wanted to, you know, rent and try out some weapons or take some classes, you could do it there. But let's look at their insignia here. On the top it says, the only family destination gun range in the world. And so they're emphasizing how they're very family friendly and it's, it's a lovely, uh, it is family friendly. It's, you know, for beginning uh, gun users, it's also very friendly and accepting and people are generally very polite there. Um, that's all kind of true. But notice the main line for the, the name of the range, gun for hire, the eye is uh, turned on its side with a pool of blood as if it's a person who's been shot in the head and is bleeding out. So on the one hand, there's an image of graphic violence built into the logo, but also a slogan that it's a family destination gun range. And this, again, I'm, I'm not mocking it. I'm just saying that this is the complexity of you know, gun culture that we often find in the United States. This is a picture I took of Shooter's World, which has a series of gun ranges and gun uh, stores in Florida. And this one is in the Villages, which is a retirement community in Florida. That's the outside. Again, lovely you know, place where you can rent firearms, buy firearms, learn about firearms. One of the centerpieces in this store is a semicircular counter with pistols on both the inner and outer sides of the semicircle. I'm told that the firing pins have been removed from all the pistols so they won't fire even if you were to put ammo in them. And each of them is attached by a cable which is attached to an alarm so you can't just walk off with them. But the idea is you can pick up any of these pistols and you can handle them, see how they feel in your hands, you can work the action, um, you know, you can point them, you can just get a feel for them in helping you pick out the right firearm for you. And these, they have rifles and shotguns, but this semicircle is all revolvers and semi-automatic pistols. There's a lot of other fun things in this store. Uh, this is the sign outside the women's room. You can see there's a picture of a woman holding a pistol. Notice she's also wearing very high heels. Again, the kind of combination of sexuality and guns. But it is, in many ways, a very family-friendly gun store. They have lots of gun-themed toys for kids, including toy guns for kids, and little sheriff's badges and things like that for the kids. The American obsession with guns is also uh, evident in our popular media. So... This, uh, for example, growing up, the, the genre of Westerns is less popular now than it used to be for a variety of reasons. But growing up, there were lots of Western set in the Old West TV shows and movies. And this is a still from some movie starring John Wayne, who was perhaps the most famous uh, actor to play in terms of playing cowboy roles. And right next to him is Kirk Douglas, another classic era actor from that era. They're both dressed up like cowboys. They're uh, firing... Uh, revolvers, probably single action army revolvers. Um, but the, you know, there are other movies that really feature firearms a lot. This is a still from the film Dirty Harry, which came out in, I think, the early 70s, starring Clint Eastwood. And uh, what the, one of the stars of the movie, in addition to Clint Eastwood, is Clint Eastwood's Smith & Wesson 44 Magnum pistol. And this is a still from a scene where he lectures a criminal he's considering shooting or threatening to shoot about how this is the most powerful handgun in the world, the 44 Magnum. At the time, it was the most powerful handgun in the world. And more recently, uh, I think everybody's favorite actor, I mean, may, or at least one of their favorites, is Keanu Reeves, and he's turned out to be a really good action movie star, uh, both in the Matrix films, but then also more recently in the John Wick films. And part of what is exciting about the movie is the use of firearms and how skilled the protagonist is. And so this kind of genre of films in which the protagonist is skilled at firearms and uses them to do good is just a staple of American movies and, and also television for a long time. Talking about the connection between religion and firearms, 
this, these are all images connected to the Rod of Iron Ministries. And one of their compounds is about two hours away from here over the border in Pennsylvania. And the Rod of Iron Ministry incorporates AR-15 rifles into some of their ceremonies. And the, the leader of the Rod of Iron Ministries is the gentleman on the, the right in this image. And as you can see, he likes to wear a crown made of bullets and he's holding an AR-15 there. And the, the name of the church comes from a line in the Bible where it says that, you know, God will destroy uh, God's enemies with a rod of iron. And I'm told that the rod of iron ministries say that, well, the, the rod of iron, that's a kind of prophecy of weapons like the AR-15, which is what, one of the reasons they incorporate it into their religious ceremonies. Um, the founder of the Rod of Iron Ministries is, as I say, the gentleman on the right. He is the son of the Reverend Sun Young Moon of the Unification Church. That's not as famous nowadays, but the, unification, the members of the Unification Church were sometimes derisively referred to as Moonies back in the day. And so you might want to, after class, look up Unification Church or Moonies to see what the background is. Um, and then here's a little photograph of the founder of the Rod of Iron Ministries with Donald Trump Jr. Uh, Rod of Iron Ministries is very big supporters of President Donald Trump. Um, so we have this very complicated relationship with uh, firearms in the United States and one that's often hard for, I think, people in other parts of the world to fathom. Friends from other countries sometimes write me and say, what is going on with your country? I don't understand it. And that's partially what we're trying to answer in this course. And of course, we have a significant divide in the United States when it comes to gun regulations. On the one hand, you have many people calling for a ban on assault rifles. Why? Well, because the United States has, as you can see from this chart on the right, and we'll look at a lot of other charts and a lot of other data, the United States has a lot more firearms than other countries. We have more than one firearm in the U.S. per citizen in the United States. And we also have a lot more gun violence uh, than other countries. Uh, and in fact, right now in the United States, on average, there is more than one mass shooting every day in the United States. Of course, some days there are no mass shootings, but then other days there's more than one. So on average, there's one mass shooting in the United States every single day of the year. So you can see why some people might, you know, say ban assault rifles. But there are many people who are very much opposed to gun regulations. Uh, and opponents of gun control consider most laws and regulations regarding firearms to be arbitrary and based on ignorance. So on the right here, you've got a sweatshirt that you could buy. Uh, and I've seen memes with the same Im similar images and you, know, you can get bumper stickers with the same thing. What's on the sweatshirt on the right is an image of an AR-15 rifle, but with the parts either mislabeled or misleadingly labeled. And that reflects the view of some conservatives that, well, liberals want to ban things they don't understand. And in particular, I have to say, opponents of gun control are absolutely right about a key point. And this is true whether you're pro-gun control or anti-gun control. Namely, banning assault rifles will have no effect on gun violence in the U.S. And you might be saying, wait, wait, that can't be right, Professor Van Orden. But it is right because genuine assault rifles, assault rifle is a technical term and genuine assault rifles are already highly regulated, rarely owned by civilians, and to the best of my knowledge, have never been used in mass shootings in the US. If they have, it's been incredibly rare. They're really not. Genuine assault rifles are not what is used in mass shootings in the US. Now, I imagine you might be thinking, well, wait a second, Van Orden. Okay, maybe you're technically right about what an assault rifle is, but you know what I mean, right? If we don't want to ban assault rifles, we want to ban assault-type rifles or military-type rifles. 
But here the problem is phrases like assault-type rifle or military-type weapons are too vague to be used in laws that would survive court challenges. I guarantee you, if you somehow manage to pass a law tomorrow, a national law in the U.S. that said we're banning assault-type rifles, the very first court case, it'll be struck down. The local courts will strike it, strike it down. It'll go all the way to the Supreme Court. It'll be struck down. Why? Because the phrase assault-type rifle is too vague to be legally enforced. Consequently, if you want to regulate or ban firearms, or if you don't, either way, you need to know what types of firearms there are if you want to have an informed opinion on gun control legislation, either for or against. Here's an example. This is a meme I've pulled off of the internet. These two rifles have the same firepower. They fire the same ammunition at the same velocity, at the same rate of fire. You can attach the same capacity magazines to either one of them. But they look really different, right? The top one is probably what you think of when you think of an assault rifle. The bottom one, I don't know what your reaction is, but it looks like a different kind of rifle. However, the rifle above, an AR-15, is, for example, highly regulated in New York State, while the rifle below, which is a Ruger Mini-14, is not highly regulated, and neither one of them is an assault rifle. So again, you have to be clear on what it is you want to regulate. So the first thing to, to learn is, and this is why the first part of the course is going to be about technology, what are the different types of firearms? How do they work? What are their abilities? What are their limitations? So you can have an informed opinion about what gun control would be about. Now, one common kind of firearm is a pistol. And a pistol is a firearm that could be shot practically with one hand. As we're going to see later in the course, there's actually some serious definitional issues about how to define different kinds of firearms. And that's one of the reasons this is a philosophy course, because we're going to look at the problem of definition. But if we're talking about, you know, pistols that could be, or weapons, firearms that could be fired with, you know, one hand, uh, that's, and they don't have a stock that you put against your shoulder, that's one way of thinking about what a pistol is. And there are two common kinds of pistols. There are other kinds, but these are the two most common, are revolvers and semi-automatic pistols. Now, in a revolver, you've got a cylinder that holds rounds. We're going to learn in this course to say rounds when we mean rounds and not bullets. Bullets are a part of a round, um, but we'll talk about that in the next lecture. But so the cylinder in a revolver holds the rounds. When the hammer is cocked, it turn, it rotates, a gear rotates the cylinder and puts a fresh round in front of the hammer. Then when you pull the trigger, it releases the hammer, which fires the bullet. And then when the trigger is cocked again, it advances to a fresh round, and then you pull the trigger and it fires again. There are broadly two kinds of revolvers and semi-automatic pistols, single action and double action. On right top here, the GIF you're looking at is a single action revolver, probably a single action army, that, which is a very famous kind of revolver that was developed in the 19th century. And you notice the person shooting it uses their thumb to pull back the hammer and then they pull the trigger with their index finger. That's single action because the only action that the trigger performs is to release the hammer firing the gun. On the bottom, you've got a double action revolver. And in a double action revolver, yeah, watch right here, when you pull the trigger, it will both cock the hammer and then release the hammer to fire. So it's double action. The trigger is doing two things, cocking and then releasing the hammer. Notice, for most double action revolvers, you could also manually cock the hammer and then pull the trigger. And the advantage of doing that is it makes the trigger pull much lighter, and so it's easier to aim the gun more exactly. Whereas when you're doing a double action, you're pulling the trigger through a long distance, and it's harder to keep the trigger, keep the gun on target. 
The other major kind of pistol is a semi-automatic pistol, and those are the pistols on the row above. In semi-automatic pistols, the rounds are usually stored in the grip in a magazine, which is spring-loaded. And the way the action works on a semi-automatic pistol is shown in the top right GIF. So you pull the trigger, the hammer or either an external hammer or an internal hammer or an internal striker goes down, fires the round. The recoil pushes the slide on the top of the semi-automatic pistol back, ejects a spent cell casing. Then the slide moves forward once all the recoils dissipated. And as it moves forward, it picks another round off of the magazine and loads it into the firing chamber and then you can pull the trigger again. So on a semi-automatic weapon, every time you pull the trigger, it will shoot as long as there's ammunition in it. There is still a difference, even in semi-automatic pistols, between single action and double action. When they're being fired, they look the same, like in that top GIF there. But the difference, if it's a single action semi-automatic pistol, then before you fire it the first time, after you've put the magazine in to load it, you have to rack the slide, pull the slide back, and that will cock the hammer, and then when you let go of it, it'll slide forward and it'll pick up a round from the magazine and load it in the firing chamber. If there's already a round in the firing chamber, then you have to cock the hammer manually with your thumb, and that's a single action, semi-automatic. If that's confusing, don't worry, we'll spend an entire class explaining how pistols work. But really quickly, that's the difference. Now, what about shotguns? So a shotgun is a, a long arm, we say. In other words, it's not a pistol. You're not supposed to fire it single-handed. And, and a shotgun typically has a stock, as you can see in these images on the right, which you hold against your shoulder and then you lean your cheek into it, called getting a cheek lock. And then you have one hand holding near the trigger, and then you have another hand, another hand holding on the front end of it. And that's very similar to a rifle, but in a shotgun, what you're firing is not a single bullet. In a shotgun, what you're firing is shot. And shot is like a bunch of little balls or little ball bearings. They come in various sizes. And the, part of the advantage of a shotgun, there's two major advantages. If you're shooting something that is fast and hard to hit, like a bird or a rabbit, the shotgun is going to send out a bunch of little balls which are gradually going to expand. The balls won't expand, but their pattern, they will move away from each other as they go away from the shotgun. So your chance of hitting the target is higher because these little, the shot, the balls that come out, are going to gradually expand as they move away. Also, an advantage of shotguns for things like home defense or for police use is they're less likely to penetrate, still could happen, but they're less likely to penetrate doors and walls than a bullet from a rifle because each of the pieces of the shot has less mass and hence less momentum as it's going out of a shotgun. And there are three major kinds of actions on a shotgun. Most common one that you see in lots of movies is pump action. And as you can see in the GIF on the left, the way it works is you, there's a pump underneath the barrel and you rack that back. And if there's a spent shell casing in the action, that will eject it. And then when you push the pump forward, it chambers another round which it takes from the magazine tube that is under the barrel. That's where the rounds are stored in the pump action shotgun. But you could also have semi-automatic shotguns. And like semi-automatic pistols, a semi-automatic shotgun, you keep pulling the trigger as long as there's ammunition in it, it will keep firing. In semi-automatic guns, they figured out a way to use the energy generated by firing the round to work the mechanism. So the thing that would be done by the pump, 
um, on a pump action shotgun, all of that is done by the internal mechanism of the semi-automatic shotgun. And again, we'll look at how that works um, later in the course. But again, as long as you keep pulling the trigger, it'll keep firing. Finally, a traditional style of shotgun is a brake action shotgun. And you can see how that works in the GIF on the lower left. Basically, a brake action shotgun, it, it hinges open like a, partially like a door hinge. And it breaks open, and then you insert the shotgun shells, and then you close it, and it locks when you close it, and then you can fire it. And you can only fire two shells because there's only, it's a, there's only two you know, uh, barrels, each of which has a shell in it. The GIF on the left has a classic side-by-side break-action shotgun, two barrels side-by-side. Side. The picture on the right is a break-action shotgun that has a barrel one over the other. It still only fires two rounds, but you break it open and then the one barrel is over the other barrel, and it's that way so that it's easier to aim because your barrels are, over, are both under the sights in the same way. Now, are there other pistol actions than the ones I showed you in the previous slide, and are there other shotgun actions than the ones I've shown you here? Yes, there are. These are just the most common ones, but later in the course we'll talk about some of the other actions that you can find, other ways of working a pistol or a shotgun. Well, now we're finally at rifles, and again, rifles fire uh, rounds that have bullets in them, um, and they've got a stock, and they're meant to be fired using two hands. Uh, and historically, when it comes to repeating rifles, rifles that you could fire multiple rounds out of before you had to reload them, one of the classic designs is the lever action. And uh, on the left, you've got a picture of a 22 lr that's a, a, a caliber of, of round. Um, and beneath that, you've got a GIF of your instructor showing you how to use the lever action. And the guy who came up with the lever action repeating rifle was named, his last name was Henry. And Henry was a very good gunsmith and inventor, but not a very good businessman. And so he invented the Henry right uh, before the Civil War. And a handful of Henrys were used by Union soldiers in the Civil War. Uh, but they really became common after the Civil War when Henry sold his patent to a guy named Winchester. And Winchester just sold, you know, thousands of these things. And the way they work is you pull the trigger, bang, and then you move the lever down, and that ejects a spent shell casing, but also cocks the hammer. And then when you bring the lever back, it chambers a new round from the tube, which is underneath the barrel, which is where the rounds are spring-loaded. Um, and uh, it, again, it's, it's a paradigmatic uh, weapon of the Old West, along with the single-action army revolver that I, I showed you in some earlier slides. Later, people figured out how to make a rifle that had a bolt action. Um, and the, the guy who really perfected this design was the, it was the Mauser Company, and a bunch of people copied the Mauser design, including in the Springfield 1903 bolt-action rifle shown on the right here. And the way the bolt-action works, you can see in the GIF below, it's not the same kind of, it's not the same rifle, but it's the same action. You know, you move the bolt up to unlock it, you pull it back, which ejects the spent shell casing, and then depending on the design, Either when you pull it back or when you push the bolt back forward, that cocks the firing pin, an internal firing pin. And then you put the bolt down to lock it. And also when you're pushing it forward, you're also taking a fresh round off of uh, the internal magazine that holds the rounds. And as you can see here in the top picture, this uh, Rifles like the Springfield are loaded using what's called a stripper clip, which is several rounds attached by like a kind of, uh, you know, almost like a U-shaped, not quite a U-shaped piece of sheet metal. And then you put it, if it's a stripper clip, you put it on top when the bolt's op open, and then you push the rounds off of the stripper clip into the internal magazine, 
you drop the, the clip, and then you close it, and you know, you're ready to fire. Now, we're finally at semi-automatic rifles and assault rifles. Let's start on the right hand here. Um, on the right, we have an AR-15. The AR in AR-15 stands for Armalite, which is the name of the company that originally designed this kind of rifle. And an AR-15 is a semi-automatic rifle. That means that every time you pull the trigger, you can see in the GIF on the lower right there, every time you pull the trigger, it'll fire as long as there is still ammunition in it. And the way we'll look in detail at the way it works, rifles like this have this really ingenious system for harnessing the energy released when you fire the round to cycle the weapon, to eject the spent shell casing, chamber a new round, and make it ready to fire again. And it's really ingenious how it works, but I, I won't go into that here. But that makes them a semi-automatic rifle. An assault rifle, there's a, a complete technical definition of an assault rifle. Technically, an assault rifle has to have a detachable box magazine. It has to have a caliber within a certain range. But most importantly, an assault rifle is capable of firing fully automatic. And that means that when you pull the trigger on a fully automatic rifle, like an assault rifle, it will keep firing as long as you hold the trigger down and as long as there's ammunition in it. So the GIF on the lower left shows you, notice that guy's finger isn't moving. He's, pull, he's pulled the trigger and as long as you hold it down, that assault rifle will keep firing as long as it's got ammunition into, in it unless you let go of the, the trigger. And for many years, the standard assault rifle in the U.S. military was the M4 carbine, which looks a lot like an AR-15. And the M4 carbine is developed from the earlier M16 assault rifle. But like I say, assault rifles are heavily regulated federally in the United States, and they're not generally used in mass shootings. You cannot go down to your gun store and just pick up an assault rifle. There are lots of other kinds of firearms, and there are other, uh, even when you're talking about rifles, again, there are other rifle actions. I'm just giving you the most common ones. But just for information purposes, some other kinds of firearms you might think about or hear about, one of the most interesting is the machine gun. And upper left here, we have the Vickers machine gun, which was used by the British military um, for a very long time. Guns like the Vickers machine gun are derived from the Maxim machine gun, which is really developed at the end of the 19th century. The Maxim gun is what changed the face of warfare permanently uh, and made modern machine gun technology possible. And if you look carefully at the Vickers, notice a couple things here. A Vickers machine gun, like the Maxim gun, it's meant to be operated by a crew of two people. Why? Well, it's heavy as heck, for one thing. Also, it's belt-fed. It's not fed by a box magazine. And in order to keep it from jamming, it's helpful if you have a second operator who's going to feed the belt into the machine gun so it doesn't jam. Notice also that, notice how thick the barrel is on the Vickers gun, and it's the same thing on the Maxim gun, and there's no, I forget what it's called, but there's an American rip off of the Maxim gun too. Why does it have such a thick barrel? It's water cooled. Because one of the problems with machine guns is because they fire so fast, they can literally melt the barrel. And so to keep the barrel from melting, the, these barrels are water cooled and there's a sleeve with water in it. And if you look at the long shot there, the the Vickers gun in the middle actually has a water container attached by a hose to the water sleeve to put fresh water in there because the water boils off. You can see some of it, you know, boiling off, I think, in that, in one of those shots there. So, but that's the classic machine gun. Um, if you, in a lot of movies and video games, you'll often also see a mini gun, which is the, the weapon in the lower right here. Um, that woman really seems to be enjoying herself shooting that. Um, so a, a minigun 
can fire at an unbelievable rate of speed. So 3,000 rounds a minute, which is 50 rounds a second, that's not even the fastest rate of fire that a minigun can achieve. They can actually fire much faster than that. And miniguns are usually, I mean, they are mounted on something, like a, like a helicopter might use a minigun, or you might use one um, on a ship, something like that. Because if you look carefully, what's happening on the minigun is you've got a series of barrels that are spinning around at high speed and being used one at a time. And the reason for that, again, is to keep the barrels from melting. And this strategy of having multiple barrels and you cycle through them was first used on the U.S. Civil War era Gatling gun, which was an early machine gun. Um, it, the, the Gatling gun's a great technological achievement. It didn't transform warfare fundamentally for a variety of reasons that we'll look at in the history section of the course in the way that the later Maxim gun, on which the Vickers gun is modeled, did transform warfare permanently. But this idea that to keep the barrels from melting, you cycle through a bunch of barrels as you're firing, that's what's used on the modern minigun because it fires at such a high rate of speed, one barrel will just melt from the, the high heat. Occasionally in movies and video games, you'll see a minigun being carried by one soldier who's got a backpack that allegedly has the ammunition and the power source that spins the Gatling barrels. Turns out that's just in movies and video games. That's not real. It's impractical for one human being to be a minigun operator without the gun being mounted on some larger vehicle. I know I was disappointed when I found that out too, but, but still the minigun's a really impressive weapon. Another interesting kind of firearm is a submachine gun. And I made this gif on the upper left here from a clip from the movie The Omega Man starring Charlton Heston. And if you're interested in campy 70s sci-fi, you need to watch The Omega Man starring Charlton Heston. It's based on a novel, I Am Legend, um, which was first made into a movie starring Vincent Price, Last Man on Earth. And again, if you love Vincent Price, gotta watch that. And then it was made into The Omega Man, which is a very campy 70s uh, spin on the story. And then Will Smith did another version of it under the title I Am Legend. But anyway, in this uh, GIF, we see Charlton Heston as Colonel Robert Neville, M.D., shooting mutants with a Smith & Wesson submachine gun. So what makes a weapon a submachine gun? It's a machine gun because as long as there's ammo in it, if you hold the trigger down, it'll keep firing. But it doesn't fire a rifle-sized round. It fires a pistol round. That's what makes it a submachine gun. And so because of that, it's easier to, to handle. Um, and uh, here uh, on the right, we have your instructor holding a Thompson submachine gun, which fires 45 ACP, also a pistol caliber. And I fired that at a range in Las Vegas in 2011. There's a lot of places in the United States where you can rent submachine guns or even machine guns, depending on the state and the store, and you can fire them just to see what it's like to fire them. So again, submachine gun, it's a machine gun, but it doesn't fire rifle-sized rounds, it fires pistol rounds. There are other kinds of firearms I haven't even mentioned here, but these are just some of the most common. Well, now that we know a little bit about the types of firearms, and we know that banning assault rifles wouldn't really change much, and so what is it? Suppose you wanted to ban firearms, uh, that are used in mass shootings, what would you ban? Well, Senator Marco Rubio is Republican, he's a conservative, he's opposed to gun control, he's a senator from Florida, and in a town hall in 2018, he kind of let the cat out of the bag. Let's see what happened. On the issue that you've raised about the background checks, relate directly to what you said about the, about the assault weapons ban. It's not the loopholes, it's the problem that once you start looking at how easy it is to get around it, you would literally have to ban every semi-automatic rifle that's sold in America. Fair enough. Fair enough. So not the reaction Rubio was looking for. And the key phrase he said is, what you need to do is you would literally have to ban every semi-automatic rifle 
sold in the United States. And he thought the audience was going to go, oh, well, we don't want to do that. But the audience applauded and said, yeah, that we would like to do that. Now, I'm not telling you how, how to vote or what to, to do, but if you wanted to ban weapons like an AR-15, and you're like, well, but what's the terminology? What am I trying to ban? You probably want to ban all semi-automatic weapons. Remember these two that we looked at, right? The upper one's an AR-15, the lower one's a Mini-14, the upper one is heavily regulated, the lower one is not, at least in New York State. Neither the AR-15 nor the Ruger Mini-14 is an assault rifle, but both are semi-automatic rifles. Now, but so could we ban semi-automatic rifles in the United States? Many people will say, no, you can't do that because it violates the U.S. Constitution, and in particular, the Second Amendment. And one of the reasons the U.S. is such an unusual country is, as far as I know, we're the only country in the world where a right to keep and bear arms in some form is written into our foundational document, our Constitution. Now, what the Second Amendment says is a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And that was passed along with the other elements of the Bill of Rights in 1791. Now again, when we get to the politics section of this course, we'll look at the legislative history of the Second Amendment and what did, you know, the Founding Fathers say about it and, you know, what have, you know, courts ruled about this. But just to give you a sense, in 1934, the Congress passed the first major legislation regulating and limiting civilian ownership of certain firearms types, like, for example, machine guns, submachine guns. Assault rifles didn't exist when the, in 1934, but machine guns and submachine guns and other things like uh, silencers or suppressors were regulated in 1934. There was a court challenge to the constitutionality of that law, and in United States v. Miller, the Supreme Court ruled that the regulations on firearms ownership were constitutional. In addition, between 94 and 2004, there is what is called the Federal Assault Weapons Ban. And part of the way they got the ban through Congress was by agreeing that it would only hold for 10 years. That's why it expired. And they didn't ban weapons by saying, we're banning assault weapons. That's what it's called, the Assault Weapons Ban. But what they did was they identified characteristics of certain rifles and said, if you have these characteristics, you know, then we're going to regulate you. And again, people who are opposed to gun regulations think that the criteria that were used are really kind of silly and arbitrary. But be that as it may, that's how that worked. Now, I'm going to say something that will be very controversial here. I think you can find one-off quotations or one-off statements to support almost any interpretation of the Second Amendment that you want. But, and here's the controversial part, the Supreme Court and the general legislative view of the Second Amendment up until the 21st century was largely based on emphasizing the first part of the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free people. And generally, this, the Second Amendment, was interpreted as being about the right of states to have a militia, like a New York National Guard or a Florida National Guard. And the thought was, that's better than having a large standing army, and it gives the state some power in case there's tyranny on the part of the federal government. And generally, the courts didn't emphasize the Second Amendment as implying an individual right to keep and bear arms. People are going to argue with me about that, but you know we'll look at the legislative history and you can decide for yourself whether you think I'm right about that. But in any case, in 2008, the Supreme Court decision, District of Columbia v. Heller, changed everything. And in that decision, uh, District of Columbia had some very strict gun control regulations and in District of Columbia v. Heller, the Supreme Court affirmed an individual right to own a firearm for self-protection 
on the basis of the Second Amendment. And that was, I would argue, a significant change in how the Second Amendment was understood. But that is the case law now. Even more radically, just recently, in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, Inc. versus Bruin, the Supreme Court overruled many state and local rules regarding firearms regulation, in particular regarding concealed carry. So the way it was before New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, Inc. versus Bruin, some states like New York had very restrictive rules on concealed carry permits. And that meant if you want to have a right to carry a pistol concealed in your purse or your jacket, or in, in your belt underneath your shirt, you need a concealed carry permit in most states. And in New York, it was almost impossible to get one, just basically impossible, unless you had a very good rash, reason for getting it. In this Supreme Court decision, the Supreme Court said, nope, that's unconstitutional under the Second Amendment. And so the default assumption is that states will issue concealed carry permits and they need a justification for not giving you a concealed carry permit. And that has significantly changed gun law in the United States. Well, so what does the Second Amendment actually mean and what does it imply? Well, again, the Second Amendment was passed with the other elements in the Bill of Rights in 1791. In 17, in this Revolutionary War and up through the War of 1812, um, actually, there wasn't one standard rifle that everybody in the military had to use in the U.S. People kind of brought their own rifles. This is true. But one of the most common rifles used by both the American Revolutionary Army, the Continental Army, and the, the British Redcoats was what's called a Brown Bess. And a Brown Bess is a smoothbore flintlock musket. And in the history part of the course, we'll look at what exactly a flintlock is and what does smoothbore mean. Um, but this, is, this would have been what people had in mind when they wrote the Second Amendment. So first, let's watch a video of a person dressed up like a British soldier showing us how to load and fire um, a brown bess. Later in the course, I'll explain each of the things he's doing and why he has to do that. That's one round. Or one firing. Two. And notice people are applauding because he managed to get off three, he fired three times in 46 seconds. With a little practice, could one get up to four rounds, you know, in one minute? Maybe. So that's kind of the upper rate of fire for a Brown Bess. Uh, it's about, you know, four rounds in a minute. And that's with a very skilled uh, rifleman under ideal conditions. Now, in the middle here, uh, we've got an AR-15, and it's being, uh, it's an illustration of quick fire uh, being given by a YouTuber, Honest Outlaw, and uh, I'm a big fa fan of his uh, videos. He seems like a nice guy. His wife also has helped him shoot his videos and also does some videos of her own. They review all kinds of firearms. Um, I disagree with their politics, but, you know, they're, they seem like nice people. Let's see uh, how he can, how you can fire an AR-15. I counted, I think, 14 rounds here. Now we're running both the uh, Brown Bess and the AR-15. So a lot higher rate of fire on the AR-15. Also, of course, the AR-15 has a box magazine, and 20 or 30 round 
uh, magazines on a uh, AR-15 are not at all unusual. Um, how fast can you replace the magazine on an AR-15? Well, here's a U.S. Uh, Marine illustrating um, a quick uh, reload on the magazine. That's it. You fire. So there's one buzzer when he's supposed to start shooting. He fires two rounds just to show that the, the rifle's in firing condition. Uh, then beep drops the magazine, loads the new magazine in. Well, now the uh, AR-15 uh, is, again, it's a semi-automatic rifle. Interesting kind of tidbit in terms of history, uh, the first widely adopted semi-automatic rifle was the M1 Garand. And uh, the proper pronunciation of Garand is Garand, but there are people who will gunsplain to you that it should be Garand. And I think they're wrong. I think it's Garand, but it's not worth getting into a big argument over. But the M1 Garand was adopted by the U.S. military before World War II. And other militaries in World War II, ha many of them did have semi-automatic rifles, but they weren't in wide use. Most armies in World War II, including the German, the Italian, Japanese, British, French, used bolt-action rifles as their primary rifle for their armies. The U.S. was unusual in that our primary rifle was a semi-automatic rifle, the M1 Garand. And on the left here, we have a famous letter by General George S. Patton. Uh, and Patton was historically one of our best like tactical generals in World War II. He was a really good commander of troops in combat. Eisenhower was a very great strategist. He was good at like getting the big picture and getting people to coordinate and handling diplomacy and all those things. But like people who like led soldiers in combat and were exceptionally good at that, Patton was one of the best. And there's a movie about him just called Patton, starring George C. Scott that came out in the 70s. If you like war movies, it's a great movie. You want to watch it. But Patton was a little prone to hyperbole, but he did say, in my opinion, the M1 rifle is the greatest battle implement ever devised. Now, why was Patton so excited about this? Because, again, nobody else in World War II had a standard semi-automatic rifle that was generally issued to their troops. Now, the Allies, led by the United States, won for a bunch of reasons in World War II, but one of them is we had a real tactical advantage because of these, this semi-automatic rifle that our, our soldiers had, whereas our opponents had to use bolt action. Now, if you look at this picture, beneath the Garand, we've got some examples of what are called N-block clips. So they're clips, but they're not stripper clips, they're N-block clips. And the way they work, you can see like this. And yes, I know this is a, uh, I know this is from a video game, it's just a video game animation, but it's a really good video game animation, so please humor me here. And, uh, and my, my wife just got home and is greeting our dog, if you're hearing that in the background. But um, the way a Garand would work, you pull the trigger until it's empty, uh, and then you reload it by taking a clip and pushing it down into the action. And this is different from a stripper clip because the entire clip goes into the M1 Garand. And then when you're through firing, the clip is ejected with a ping at the end. So you can see the, the casings are already being ejected as you fire, but then when the last casing goes out, the end block clip goes ping and it gets sent out. So it really was a major technological breakthrough and something very different from something like, you know, a, a brown vest. Um, how does the M1 Garin compare to the AR-15? Well, one advantage the M1 Garin has is it's got a much more powerful round. The M1 Garin fires a 30-06 round, which is the same as 7.62 millimeter, versus the round fired by the AR-15, which is 223 or 5.56 millimeter. Um, again, we'll look at calibers in our next lecture. But the AR-15 has its own advantages. It's shorter than the M1 Garand, lighter, hence easier to conceal. It's got a much greater ammunition capacity. It's very easy to load a 20 or 30 round magazine into an AR-15, whereas the M1 Garand does not have a detachable box magazine. It's got those end block clips, which hold eight rounds. 
and uh, the AR-15 is easier to reload. And so I don't want to overemphasize it, but the box magazine is easier to drop and reload than the end block clips. Soldiers who were experienced with the end block clip could reload them pretty fast, but you know, it could also like it could catch there's a thing called Garen thumb, where your thumb gets caught by the bolt as you're trying to, you know, reload the end block clip. And it's just really easy to reload an AR-15. And also the AR-15, although the round is less powerful, it's still plenty powerful. And, but it's lower recoil and much easier to shoot than the M1 Garand. Well, you can kind of see where I'm going here. Uh, maybe, you know, the, the people who wrote and voted for the Second Amendment, you know, wouldn't have imagined, they wouldn't have imagined that we could have weapons like the AR-15 with such a high rate of fire. In fairness, people who are opposed to gun regulations would say, well, maybe they didn't know how technology was going to develop, but, you know, they also didn't know about telephones, um, and they didn't know about cell phones, and they didn't know about, uh, you know, email. But we have extended first, you know, uh, Bill of Rights protections to unlawful, you know, uh, search and seizure, to your email and we extend it you know to your your telephone calls you got to get a subpoena or a warrant if you want to you know listen to somebody read somebody's emails or you want to you know listen to their phone conversations so isn't this a parallel case where the technology is, is changed but we apply the same rights to new technology so suppose you think that, you know, it, you think that based on your understanding of the Second Amendment and your understanding of the development of firearms technology, you feel like, you know, we ought to limit semi-automatic rifles. Again, I'm not telling you which side to come down on, but here are a couple things to think about. First of all, fun fact, in the Greco-Persian War, which is a major historical event that shaped the later history of Greece and also of Europe in general, uh, the Persian king Xerxes invaded Greece and demanded that the Greeks surrender their weapons. The Spartan general Leonidas replied simply, come and take them. It's a great line. I mean, one of the best, you know, comebacks in all of world history. Yeah, you want our weapons? Come and take them. And in Greek, that's Malone Labe. And you might know there's a, a film, 300, about the beginning of the Greco-Persian War came out in 2006. In some of my other lectures, I talk about this film and its cultural significance. And this is a clip showing King Xerxes meeting uh, the Spartan general Leonidas. And there's a lot going on um, in this clip that we could talk about. Um, but, and it, it's, if you like violent movies, you know, and it's very visually stylish, you'll like 300, but if you don't like violent films, you're not going to like it. Uh, but anyway, that's the, the story behind it. The phrase, usually Latinized as Malon Labe, has become a slogan of many gun owners. And this is a, a picture from a, a website, uh, someone advertising a t-shirt that's got that slogan on it. I've seen hoodies, sweatshirts, bumper stickers, uh, cell phone backs that have this sl slogan on it. And it's used to indicate that gun owners will refuse to surrender their firearms, even if instructed to do so by the government. So would banning firearms or even banning only certain classes of firearms be effective in the U.S. if gun owners would refuse to hand over their firearms as they say that they will do? Something to think about. Another thing to think about is the diversity of people who own firearms. This is a really interesting book that came out just recently. It's by an Italian photographer who came to the United States kind of fell in love with our country, but also was fascinated with the fact that many Americans don't own guns, don't want to own guns, want, would like to re heavily regulate or even ban many kinds of firearms. But many other Americans don't want to ban firearms and own lots and lots of guns. So he wrote this book where he took pictures of different families and different people with their extensive gun collections. On the cover is a picture of a man who has made 
for the purposes of this photo shoot, a map of the United States in his backyard out of all the firearms he owns. Now, when you, I you know, recommend looking at this book, to be honest, I don't want to stereotype, but many people in the book, you look at them and you say, yeah, I bet you do own a bunch of firearms. That doesn't surprise me at all. Again, I don't have any, anything against this nice couple here, but, you know, I look at, you know, their porch and, you know, the deer antlers they have in the background and like, I just like, yeah, it doesn't surprise me they own all these different pistols and rifles. But one of the interesting things about this book is that you see that there are all kinds of different people who own firearms. People of different races own a number of firearms. People with different lifestyles own sometimes a lot of firearms. And sometimes firearms laws are enforced differently depending on who owns the firearms. So for example, in 2020, attorneys, Mark and Patricia McCloskey, their husband and wife who are also attorneys, pointed firearms at unarmed Black Lives Matters Black Lives Matter protesters walking past their house. They were in a gated community, so in fairness, it was not a public road, but the people had entered the gated community to go and protest in front of the mayor's house, and the mayor lived in the gated community. That involved walking on the street in front of the McCloskey's house. The McCloskey's came out, as you can see in this photograph, and they pointed guns at the unarmed Black Lives Matter protesters. Now, you can't just be brandishing guns at, uh, you know, unarmed people who are not actively threatening you, so they were charged with a felony. They made a plea deal down to a misdemeanor, and then they were pardoned by the governor of their state and became featured speakers at the 2020 Republican National Convention. So that's what happened to them. Now, uh, I also understand that their law licenses are at risk at this point, although the last time I checked, it seemed like the issue had not been uh, fully decided, but it, there is a chance that they're going to lose their law licenses as well. Here's a very different example. And, you know, this is going to be a painful slide, so if you need to look away for a second, you know, that, that's okay. In 2016, school cafeteria supervisor Philando Castile was driving with his girlfriend and infant daughter when they were stopped by the police. Why were they stopped by the police? Well, the officer thought that uh, Mr. Castile looked like somebody who had committed a robbery recently. It turns out that Castile had been stopped on numerous occasions by the police, again, just because he looked suspicious. Castile had a legal permit to carry a weapon on him. And not wanting to surprise the officer, he informed the officer that he had a pistol on him. Castile showed the officer his pistol and may have touched it. There's no evidence that he drew the pistol, but he wanted the officer to know, so he said, look, here's my pistol. He may have touched the, the pistol. The officer immediately shot Castile seven times, twice in the heart, killing him instantly, in front of his uh, girlfriend and their baby. Now the officer was charged with manslaughter, but was acquitted. Uh, the officer was removed from the police force, but he was also given a severance package and other benefits that totaled around $50,000. So another question to think about just to complicate the issue is, if we have laws banning firearms or banning certain classes of firearms, will they be enforced equitably in the United States. Now the last thing I want to talk about in today's lecture, and again next lecture we'll talk about like uh, what are rounds, what are bullets, how do they get fired, what, how does a barrel work, things like that. But the uh, one thing I want you to learn in the course is basic rules of firearm safety. And you might say, hey Professor Van Norden, I'm never gonna buy a firearm. I'm never gonna fire a firearm. I'm never gonna touch one. I don't care. There are, a lot, there are more firearms in this country than there are people, so you need to know these rules of firearm safety. And there are different forms the rules can take, and some people use slightly different rules, but these are one of the best 
formulations of basic rules of firearm safety, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many other people. First, treat all firearms as loaded, even if you are sure, even if you know that they are not loaded. Why? Because one of the most common things you hear after a negligent discharge, after someone gets shot or killed by accident, is the person saying, I didn't know it was loaded. So treat all firearms as loaded, even if you know they're not. Second, always point a firearm in the safest possible direction. So if you pick up a firearm, you have to be aware where is it pointed and what is the safest place I can point it. We say safest because there's, it's rare that there's ever a direction that's completely safe. Um, if you're at a gun range, pointing it down range is safest. In fact, that's almost completely safe because gun ranges are designed for you to shoot targets, and then behind that, they've got something that will absorb the rounds, and usually the rest of the range is made in a concrete, so it, that's as safe as you could be. If you're outside, usually straight up or straight down is the best place to point it. And if you're inside a building, you have to think about what is the safest direction to point the firearm. You know, so for example, um, if I uh, pointed back towards that wall, where there's a bunch of books there, if I was pointing a firearm back that way, the wall and the books might stop around, but what if I know there's someone in the bathroom behind that wall? Well, then that's not a good place to point that. If I point that direction, that's towards, sorry, on your camera, that, sorry, that direction, <laughs> uh, it, uh, it, from your perspective, that's my, live, that's my dining room, there's not anybody in the dining room now, and there's one office wall, and then the dining room, and another external wall, and then there's a yard, a small yard that usually nobody's in, and then my neighbor's house. That's a pretty safe direction in this room to be pointing, but you gotta think about that. Third rule, keep your finger off the trigger until you are ready to shoot. Fourth rule, know what you are shooting at and what is behind it. That requires a little explanation, Part of what that means is, if you are going to keep a firearm for self-defense, you don't shoot at noises, you don't shoot at shadows. If you're hunting and you hear a rattling in the leaves, you're like, oh, I bet it's a deer. Don't shoot unless you can see that deer. People have been killed hunting because somebody heard a noise, thought it was a deer, and they shot them. If you're target shooting, make sure there's something behind your target that will observe the, absorb the bullet or the shot. And if, God forbid, you're in a defensive shooting situation, you've got to think, are there innocent bystanders or easily pierced walls or doors near or behind your target? And so in training scenarios, police are taught to take those things into consideration. Um, and if you're going to use a pistol or rifle or shotgun, you've got to think about that too. Now, next thing I'm going to show you, no one was hurt in any of these clips. But this is a compilation of what are called negligent discharges. And that's a fancy term they use for when you accidentally fired a firearm when you didn't mean to. It's probably a good term because what I was taught was don't call it accidental discharge. Accidental makes it sound like you didn't do something wrong. If you had a negligent discharge, it's because you were negligent, you did something stupid. So if you want to look away because you find this disturbing, you can, but I promise you, no one was injured in, thank God, in any of these cases. But just to illustrate- So what, what you do happened. is when you pull the hammer back, so this gun's totally loaded, you have to push down the hammer before you even pull the trigger. And once you do that, it enables you to- You're gonna walk to out. Pull your this arm. is a firearm You're gonna push with your right and pull with your left. Focus on that front sight tip. Now, if you want on this 44 Magnum, you can shoot it single action. Did you mean to do that? Yeah. <laughs> That's an instructor. That's not an instructor. Oh, that was smart. It's a semi automatic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, this is the kind of ammo shoots. Pump 12 gauge shotgun. Uh, this is a 12 gauge bird shot. Also, this weapon has uh, this cool feature. 
where you press the trigger down, you can, and once you press this down and pull it up. Not a lot of people know, know what all the ins and outs do. about this pistol, and, uh, you know, we're going to... This is a police officer in a classroom. Okay, I'm the only one in this room professional enough that I know of to carry this Glock 40. I'm the only one. Hey, 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 hey. Come on, is everybody all right? You all right? Now, as a, in point of fact, all of these negligent discharges are due to violations of rule three, namely keep your finger off the trigger until you are ready to shoot. So again, the basic rules of firearm safety are treat all firearms as loaded even if you know they are not loaded. Always point a firearm in the safest possible direction. Keep your finger off the trigger until you are ready to shoot. Know what you are shooting at and what is behind it. You will memorize these four rules by the time you leave this class. Not today, I mean this course. By the time you finish this course, you will memorize these four rules or God is my witness, I will flunk you. I'm not kidding about this. I will give you random oral pop quizzes on these rules. Now, if you get the quiz wrong once, that's not gonna, that's not gonna flunk you. If you just say, I only remember two of the rules. Okay, tell me the two you remember. I'll tell you the other two. We'll say them together. And we'll make sure by the end of the course, everybody in this course can recite the four rules. So, in other words, you're not going to flunk for getting them wrong once. But by the time this course is over, I expect you to memorize these. I will not accept as an excuse that you're not planning on buying or shooting a firearm. There are so many firearms in this country, you don't know when you might run across one. And it's helpful to know, watching people, is that person using the gun safely or are they making basic errors in firearms usage. So this is the end of today's lecture. This is uh, end of lecture one in philosophy 183, firearms, technology, history, and politics. Next time we'll look at what are rounds, what are bullets, how are they fired in a barrel. Thank you very much.